to know what you feel uh, as far as the responsibilities of representing mankind on this trip. That's uh, relatively difficult to, to answer. Uh, it's a job that we collectively said that was possible and we could do. And, and of course, the, the nation itself is backing us. So we just sincerely hope that we measure up to that. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 223. Releasing in Australian cinemas this July 18 is Apollo 11, an outstanding documentary that focuses on the 1969 mission to land a man on the moon and change the course of human history. Consisting of never-before-seen 70mm footage and audio recordings, Apollo 11 is a breathtaking and engrossing reminder of an awe-inspiring feat in human ingenuity, that will celebrate its 50th anniversary this year. Joining me now to talk about Apollo 11 is the film's archival producer, Stephen Slater. Stephen, I thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. It's a real pleasure, Matt. Um, nice to be with you. So I just want to talk a, a little bit about yourself as in your uh, trajectory from a director. You started as a director in your career to archival producer. I was just curious, what was it about that form of filmmaking that really appealed to you? Um, I just, I, you know, I, I think there's so many buried uh, treasures in, in archives. I, I did a film, as you say, called, I, I assume you're talking about Destination Titan. This was a, a documentary about the Huygens space probe, which landed on Titan. And because I couldn't actually have, I was too young to have been able to go and film it when it was happening. I was 18 when, during the landing, and it was quite um, an emotional experience for me watching that. Um, and I felt I wanted to do a film about it. But then... The thing was that uh, to tell that story, you had to had to track down all the film of them building the probe, and um, so that just got me really interested in the archive thing. I'd always been interested in the moon landings. I think probably from seeing Ron Howard's Apollo 13 movie at the cinema when I was a kid, um, and so it never really left me. And so when the opportunity came up to work on films about Apollo, it just was a natural fit that I would take those skills in, into that arena. Interesting thing about Apollo 11 is that this project at first, if I'm correct, it started off with you working a 30-minute film on Apollo 17, which was the last yeah, main correct. mission to yeah. the moon. So what was the transition from working on that film to working on Apollo 11? Yeah, so in early 2016, actually, Todd Douglas Miller, the director of, of Apollo 11, actually contacted me about um, the last step. So I'd previously worked on a film called The Last Man on the Moon, which was actually also dealt with Apollo 17. It was about Gene Cernan, who was the commander of that mission. Mm -hmm. And so his idea was, yeah, again, we'll, we'll do all this, tell the story of Apollo 17, no, art, no um, uh, interviews, uh, no narration, just with the audio available. And I, was, I wasn't, um, I was like, oh, okay, how's this going to work? Um, and then a few months into it, we actually had a... Um, we had a rough cut together, and it was just—I was just astonished by how good it was and how how well edited it was. And he just got a great composer, and he just really knows what he's doing. And 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 so I came to him at the end of that project. Actually, it was—we were in a bar in East Hampton um, because the film premiered at the Hampton Film Festival. This was in October 2016, and I said, "Well, you know, I've done all this um, background work." primarily actually synchronizing mission control audio to film footage from Apollo 11, which is a very long story. I don't know quite how much you want to go into it, but um, I, I had to have all this stuff, and the 50th anniversary is coming up, and you know, it might be an opportunity to do something very similar for, for, the, um, for Apollo 11, but I didn't quite imagine it was going to be <laughs> uh, the big film that it's become. The 70 millimeter archival footage, which is really is the selling point for this movie, um, you mentioned before you had some of the footage. Did you find more footage after you and Todd got um, together, or did you have the, the main bulk of the footage ready to go? Yeah, well, what I had was 16-millimeter um, films. So this was all the films shot by the astronauts on the flight, and then a lot of the stuff shot in mission control, where I'd actually, it was all shot completely mute, but I'd, I'd gone through this painstaking process of manually lip-syncing it to the flight loops. Um, so... So that was the basis on which we started, and we wanted to try and find all the highest quality versions of that material so that we could scan it at you know, super high resolutions for a cinema release film. You have to go back to what people don't understand, but 
if, you, if you're doing something for cinema, you always need to try and get, get, go to original source material. Mm. Um, and so um, we, we were doing that. We were speaking with the National Archives in the US. And then on May the 10th, 2017, we got an email from the head archivist of the Motion Picture Division saying, guys, look, we, we found 165 reels of 70 millimeter film. Um, it's in, we think it's in pretty good condition. A third of it's uh, related to Apollo 11. Does this maybe change the scope of your project? And yeah, we were just stunned. And that became, I'd say, the main selling point of the film and the main thing we focused our attention on. In addition to the, the 16 millimeter um, footage emission control, which I'd say was, was in some ways was just as important because once we're in space, that's our main... Um, resource, yeah. uh, apart from the, the footage of them still shot on the fly. You mentioned before the 16mm footage you had had no sound. What about the 70mm footage? Was it the same thing where it had no sound and you had to go through the process of syncing this um, sound, fo- um, the uh, audio to the visual? Um, yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no native 70mm uh, um, sound. It's um, Anything you see in the film, whether sound and the 70 mil film has been added by sound design or um, uh, and all the mission control sync material that we talked about is 16 mil film. So, uh, yeah, I'd say that sound recorders were obviously not a thing back then. When it comes to making a documentary about Apollo 11, there's been so much material and so many feature films, documentaries made about this event already. You spoke before that you went, when you and Todd got together, you didn't want to interview heads, you didn't want the narration. Is there anything uh, else that you wanted to approach with this documentary that you wanted to differentiate with anything else that came beforehand? Um, well, how did we want to do it differently? I mean, I, I, it, it's just been done wrong so many times, and people don't put the... I'd say partly because the the, the, the film is, is, was so randomly assembled, people just... It just wasn't in the right... Um, format or the right um, chronology so that people couldn't show stuff as it was happening because they didn't have the time. It all assembled into a timeline. So so that was putting all the groundwork in to, to determine that chronology was very important. So we wanted, to, wanted this to be accurate. We're not just blindly showing any shot of a console or something um, as a cutaway. And, and it's a trap that many filmmakers fall into is that they just feel this thing, they, they like to cut these things to shreds and I just like to let the audio, the audio and the footage speak for itself. One thing that you guys did with this film as well, which I thought was very cool, was you have these brief animations in our, to kind of break down the science, because it could get very complex um, in regards to the things that are on the screen. Is it true though that back in 69 and for other missions as well, that NASA had similar diagrams as well to kind of break down things for other people as well? Yeah, they did. In fact, it was very, it was inspired by a couple of things. Some of the technical manuals, I know it really inspired those uh, that they released to the press had diagrams like that and they inspired the very simple animation style. And also there was a documentary called Moonwalk One, which was released in 1970. It became a kind of a cult classic and in fact a lot of the 70 mil material was shot for Moonwalk One, and uh, they deployed a very similar basic uh, cell animation style. Um, but I think it's very effective. I think, again, there's, there's this temptation that, particularly with films, having to, when they don't have narration, they have text cards come up explaining every detail. And it, we just found that it worked very nicely having these public affair officer guys who explain what was happening. They, they worked in mission control, and they... they had voices a bit like airline pilots, and they would just describe what was hap- going to happen. And then we illustrated that with these very simple diagrams. So keep it simple. I, there's no need to to be fancy with that, I don't think. A, a part of this movie, which I think is kind of like the unsung hero, is the score by Matt Morton. It's just terrific stuff. Is it true well, that... You said that because it, it's one of my favourite things. I mean, he's... Um, he's kind of a genius, really. He spent a lot of time, as I did, in his basement trying out all these different soundscapes, and he decided to make it entirely using instrumentation that was invented in 1969. So, um, 
nothing. Um, it's all period. It's all feels like it could have happened then. And, if, and melodically and sonically, it's beautiful. I love the rendezvous scene when the lunar module lifts off the moon and is coming in to meet Michael Collins, who was orbiting. Um, that's, one of my, that's actually my favourite scene in the film, and a lot of it's down to Matt's music. That, I was going to actually mention that scene when um, Columbia meets Eagle above the moon. It's almost like a dance, don't you think? Yeah, it's a beautiful demonstration of orbital mechanics um, in play. It's like a waltz, and then you know the, the, the figures that had to be worked out to perform all those manoeuvres is kind of mind blowing. So uh, it's a great testament to, to what they achieved there. Um, when it comes to music in the film, there is a scene where we hear the song Oh Mother Country from Jon Stewart. I'm curious, of all the footage that you had of of these guys in their capsule, up in orbit, whether they're outside of Earth or going to the moon, did you find any other moments where they're listening to songs? Because I'm sure they're going to have something like that to keep their minds uh, during, uh, keep their minds stimulated during the dull moments when they're up in space, so to speak. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just checking the time. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, the, the astronauts did take um, music tapes with them, um, and there is quite a, quite a bit of onboard audio. There was kind of black box style recorders recording a lot of their conversations, and we could use that to pick out what they were listening to. But, I mean, a lot of it is documented. What, what they took, what songs they took. But it was our producer, Tom Peterson, who was just going to work one day and listening to, to one of these onboard audio tracks, and he picked out this very tinny new track in the background, wondered what it was, and eventually managed to pin it down as being another country. And there, you know, we had a sequence to, um, to pin that around, and I think it works beautifully. I think it's one of my, it's probably my second favourite sequence in the film, uh, aside from the rendezvous. Final question, uh, Stephen. You've worked as an archival producer for a while now. Um, your dedication to finding footage in regards to space travel and stuff has been just outstanding. This definitely has to be your the, one of the great moments of your career so far. How do you follow up something like this? Go on holiday. Um, <laughs> somewhere very sunny and the beach and uh, not think about the moon for a while, I think. Uh, but then I'm sure something will come up. Um, I'm very interested in the unmanned space probes from... Uh, I directed a documentary called Destination Titan, which was yep. all about the, the um, Huygens landing on, on um, uh, Titan. And so I'd like to, to possibly do something in that regard. But, um, uh, yeah, um, I do have other interests apart from space, and maybe I'll be pursuing some of those. But uh, it's hard to know what, what to say. Ask me in five years. Hopefully in five years we will be able to talk again. So for everyone listening, July 18, Apollo 11 in Australian cinemas. It's an outstanding documentary. And Stephen Slater, to you, congratulations. You did great work here. Um, I'll leave you alone, alone now. And uh, best of luck uh, with the rest of the release in Australia. Thanks. Thanks for your time. Thank you.